Thank you, Chairman Doyle. I wanted to start with Mr. Uh, Srihari. As you know, Congress has already been very active in supporting ways to make our wireless infrastructure and its supply chain more secure through the Secure and Trusted Networks Act and the USA Telecommunications Act, which still needs funding. But in your written testimony, you note that open architectures could reduce the global grip of Chinese firms on the market and provide other advantages to both large and small providers. Could you explain what some of those advantages might be, if you will? Sure, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would begin with greater flexibility. You avoid uh, the problem of vendor lock-in if you're an operator, especially a small operator, from being locked into one particular vendor. You also get more flexibility in terms of where you house network functions, out on the edge, on the towers, or in the core of your network. Also lower costs. We've seen evidence that uh, open RAN deployments can be more cost effective than, than traditional deployments. They also permit gradual upgradability over time, software-based upgrading rather than hardware uh, rip and replacements that can lower costs. New innovation, new technology through artificial intelligence and machine learning to do things like automated uh, threat detection, um, stronger security, um, energy efficiency. Uh, there, there are a number of these kind of technical benefits as we think about uh, networks not just as a box that you deploy every 10 years, but switching to a software virtualized ecosystem that's going through a cycle of constant, continuous improvement and continuous development. All right, thanks. Let me go to Mr. Boswell. You refer in your testimony to Ericsson's ongoing work in the FCC CISRIC and that Ericsson has been engaged across several working groups in the most recent iteration of CISRIC focused on 5G security. And one of the bills we're considering today would make CISRIC permanent. So do you have a view on why making CISRIC permanent could be good for industry and good for the country as a whole? Yes, I do. And I, actually, I have, I have two comments. Uh, first, I would like to address Mr. Shrihari's uh, comments about some of the, the benefits there and just add some clarification that uh, many of those benefits listed are not uh, unique uh, to an open RAN or even open system architecture. Uh, 3GPP has long been an, an open and interoperable system. Uh, and furthermore, from a software development, uh, software upgradability standpoint, when Ericsson rolled out radios, uh, there are tens of thousands of radios across the US as long as five years ago, those have been upgradable to 5G with over-the-air software updates since we put them in. So much of that is not unique. Uh, my time on CISRIC has been uh, very well spent and very uh, enjoyed, in particular with gentlemen like Farouk at Qualcomm. I've, I very much enjoyed working with him uh, in the past. Um, I have firsthand knowledge of the importance of the work that CISRIC does. Uh, and this bill that you've talked about, it recognizes the significance of that task. And in some cases, it's, uh, it's, it's bleeding edge or cutting edge things that we're doing for new roles like network slicing, or 5G standalone networks, or how to enhance E911. And those are great. That's new best practices for cutting edge things. But we also, as I mentioned before, we, we've taken a look at things like, well, how can we help smaller operators that are transitioning from 4G to 5G? This is a big leap. It's a completely different kind of architecture. It's a software-based infrastructure. For many of them, it's just a brand new world. And so uh, one of the working groups, specifically this, this past CISRIC, looked at how to secure that transition to keep them secure throughout that process. So we really look at both ends of it. I think it's very important to, uh, to formally codify and, and recognize the work that CISRIC does. Thank, Thank you. you. And then Mr. Brenner, you write in your testimony about the emergency broadband benefit, which will provide discounted connectivity and equipment to about three million low-income households, and the emergency connectivity fund, which provides devices and connectivity to millions of K through 12 students. And I'm very proud of that work. But in light of what I hope will be millions of devices getting to kids and families across the country very shortly, can you explain why it's important to make sure that those devices come from trusted vendors and describe how the government and industry can work together to make that happen, to ensure that? Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much for the question. And I'm very excited about both the ECF and the EBB programs. And I, in addition to giving a shout out to this subcommittee for the programs, Acting Chair Jessica Rosenworcel over at the FCC has done a tremendous job that not only meeting the deadlines, but forging bipartisan consensus on the rules for both of the programs and then having this hugely successful rollout. The short answer to your question, Chairman Pallone, is you know, devices that have a Qualcomm chip inside, whether it's a smart, whether it's a, in this case, a laptop, a tablet, 
um, a fixed wireless device, a modem, or a router. Um, we spend a fortune to ensure that our devices that have our chip inside are secure, are reliable, can be trusted. We work with every device manufacturer in the world to make sure of that, to constantly test. When there are issues spotted, we you know, pounce on them immediately. So it's obviously crucial for these programs to be successful, and I think we, you know, which we would like to see for sure, and hopefully for these programs even to become permanent, that the devices be absolutely reliable and secure, and I have every confidence that that's happening. Gentlemen's Thank time you. has expired.